welcome to In the Community. And with us today is author Raven West. And she has written a book that I have had the pleasure of reading. It's called Red Wine for Breakfast. And Raven, good to have you with us. Thank you so much for inviting me. This is a pleasure to be able to have the opportunity to talk about my novels and hear how wonderful they are. I know that. <laughs> <laughs> I tell people my books aren't great because I wrote them. They're great because I read them and I reread them. And every time I read them, I wrote this? This is really good. So that's the author writer dichotomy. Okay, very good. Well, you have written this book that I did read. It's called Red Wine for Breakfast. And it takes place in a radio station, mm -hmm. KTKM, if I recall correctly. That's correct. And there are some principal characters, and we're going to go through each of these characters with you, and we're going to ask that you kind of give us some infill as to who these characters are and how they relate to the story. We won't give the plot away, okay. because with every chapter, and the chapters are fairly short, but every chapter you have a little bit of a twist of course. to hook you into <laughs> reading on further. And the end actually kind of took me a little bit by surprise, I must tell you. Good, good. Well, I do have to tell you and everyone watching this that Red Wine for Breakfast is not a cookbook. All right. You won't find any <laughs> recipes in here. But you have a recipe for adventure, intrigue, and perhaps murder. No, oh, maybe. 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 Well, okay, let's go through the characters. Sure. Let's talk about Brian Allen. What would you like to know about well, Mr. Brian, Allen? Well, <laughs> Brian Allen and his wife, Denise, are in charge of KTKM. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's kind of um, an interesting cat, should we say. Uh, yeah, he was. He is understanding that whatever I write is part fact, part fiction, and part fantasy. So almost all my characters in my novels are sort of based on people who I have had encounters with. But then obviously when I write them, I get to play around with them a little bit more and exaggerate a little bit with certain parts, <coughs> especially Brian's part. <laughs> which really makes the whole connection between the characters very interesting and involved. So they're not just, here's a character here, a character there. They all have a beginning, a middle, and an end, and a story within themselves that is intertwined with all the other characters. But we'll come back to his wife, Denise, in just a little bit. But the primary character is Jenny Reed. Yes. Now, Jenny is a probably in her early to mid-30s. Mm -hmm. She's out of New York. She's coming to Los Angeles, where this radio station is based in, or based on. And um, her and Brian are a little bit involved at the very beginning. Oh, a little bit more than that, <laughs> I would say. Um, now, Brian is the station manager. Jenny Reed is the star of a talk show, Reading in the Morning or music show, I should say, because she adamantly hates talk. Now understand that the time frame for this book is in the early 80s. So the radio station is not the way it is today. There's a lot more interaction. When you go into a room that's full of vinyl records, you could actually smell the music. So there's a connection between the radio announcer slash DJ and the actual board that they're working on while they're behind the desk with this little microphone. I call it the 10,000 watt orgasm. I like that term. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're in radio, you understand what that yes. means when that anonymous voice comes over the airways that it used to be way back when we were a lot younger that we would listen to radio personalities at 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock in the morning, especially on FM, and when FM was not AM as it is today, and they would speak to us. And when it was lonely and you're by yourself and you hear this voice talking and you really felt a connection to the voice as Johnny's politely referred to in the story, 
and he has that voice. And, and it became much more than just, here's a, a commercial or an intro. These radio personalities became part of our lives. And they connected in a real, real and vibrant way. I mean, you pointed out very succinctly that yes, I've been in radio, still am in radio, and it has evolved from vinyl records to CDs, and now it's a lot of stations, if not all, are on hard drive or have a satellite feed. Mm -hmm. And it's the dynamics have changed over the years. Sure. But this was back in the day when vinyl records were still mm -hmm. being used and played. And Jenny Reed, her background, from what I can recall in the book, she was had developed this character from her real name because Jenny Reed is a pseudonym mm -hmm. and her real name is Doris Levine. Right, Doris Levine. Or Levine. <laughs> and she was from New York, as it says in the back, uh, a native New Yorker has to kick off the laid back uh, LA to uh, succeed in an industry drowning in testosterone where Stations changed formats the way most people change socks. And speaking of socks, <clears throat> I don't know if you noticed in my the toe, book. The, the factor with the socks. The is, socks test. Yes, yes, the sock test. Yes, so there are three, there are two themes that run through all of my novels. Somewhere in the novel, there is the socks test. And my number one rule in life, sorry, speaker. <laughs> You always keep a bottle of champagne in the refrigerator because you never know when you're going to have something to celebrate and you don't want to be without champagne. So even if it's a little fifth or a large, whatever, and when you drink that bottle for your celebration, you replace it. So that is a main theme, theme through all of my novels as well and my number one rule of life. So when I get done with this show, I will go celebrate with my bottle of champagne that's in the refrigerator. <laughs> All right, so we have Jenny Reed, who was originally Doris, but she was perhaps a little bit overweight mm -hmm. growing up, and she worked on her self-image and became Jenny Reed, and she had this voice that would knock your socks off. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was, that was no matter what the physical looked like, and that was one of the things that the character really loved about being on the radio, because when you listen to a voice, you have an imagination of what the person looks like. Well, unfortunately for Jenny, once her show became extremely popular, when she got linked up with uh, Johnny, and they changed the name of her show from Reading in the Morning to Red Wine for Breakfast, and the reason, of course, is in the book, all of a sudden, her face is everywhere. She's no longer anonymous. She no longer is behind the scenes voice. And she's uncomfortable with that. She enjoyed having that distance where she could be famous, but she could go to the grocery store at 1 and o'clock in the afternoon and not be unless, recognized. In, in fact, you pointed out in the book, she would go to the grocery store. And the only way that she would be recognized if she were to respond to a question by a cashier. Mm -hmm. Very different than today. Because today, if you, whatever you tweet, whatever it, it's Twitter and tweeting and everything with the social media, your face is everywhere, even your icon or your avatar. So it's really hard to stay anonymous in today's society anywhere, unfortunately. But back in the day, she could be famous in her own right and yet still have her own life which was very important to her. And I think you pointed out with the social media, you know, every radio station that I'm aware of has some kind of a web presence. Mm -hmm. And on that web presence, they will put up pictures of all of their on-air personalities, yeah. whether it be somebody local or somebody in syndication. Which could be good or not good. I, especially in LA, we were so interested in the way the anchors look. Looks are what sells, obviously, whether you're getting a job <clears throat> on a TV, anchor. There are a few that are not, it's not so much as it used to be. So when you're having a really phenomenal voice that tickles the imagination of the listener 
and then you connect that with the reality of the person behind the voice, it takes you a step away from your own personality, which is the same as when someone does an audiobook. I've had several uh, publishers say, we want to do this for audiobooks. I said, you can't do that. Because the moment you have someone else read your book, unless it's uh, for the, the sight impaired, of course, because we do that. But if you have someone else's voice reading the book, it takes it away from your imagination of what that person sounds like. And when a book is transformed into a movie or a TV show, it takes it away again from the author. No matter what author that you love, it's the director and the writer that reinterprets it for the audience. And of course, the audience then sees these characters, but it's not their characters. So when I write a character like Johnny King, who doesn't exist, and somebody comes up to me and says, ah, Johnny King, he's such a SOB, I can't stand him. That feels great because he's not real. <laughs> so if I can create a character, and I'm sure every fiction author out there feels the exact same way, out of your imagination that produces that kind of reaction from the reader without being tainted by someone else's interpretation, that person becomes theirs, and then they get that personal connection, which is in all of my novels, for the most part, I know who these people are. Well, one of the things that has always intrigued me about radio if you go back to the earlier days of radio, you had radio theater, whether mm -hmm. it be oh, comedy sure. or drama, mystery, but it became theater of the mind. Mm -hmm. There's, they were redoing those occasionally. You might catch one once in a while on a NPR or a station, but again, it's all imagination. If you're doing horse hooves, you've got the sound, and then the imagination just takes it and it's so much better than the visual. I mean, visual, how many TV shows, the, the violence out there, every cop show, it's, you don't need to see all the blood and the guts, because it's all fake, for the most part. But to describe something in that colorful, using the words, words are so much more powerful than pictures. It's true what they say. <laughs> well, you know, you talk about the, you know, the kind of the theater where of, on the radio um, for a shameless self-promotion radio station I work for, Sunday through Thursday nights we do radio mystery theater. Mm -hmm. And it is really caught on. Sure. <clears throat> because people can actually envision within their own mind and develop, you know, maybe a scene playing out in their head as to what's going on. Yeah. Well, one of the reasons I wrote uh, the, my first novel, uh, Red Wine for Breakfast, the setting of a radio station was because I worked at a radio station. So a lot of the description of the feeling and the people, obviously people say, write what you know. A little bit of what I know, a lot of what I wish I knew. But there was nothing out there in that genre, and I don't believe there is anything out there in that genre with the backstory of a radio station. And the same thing with First Class Mail. The hero is a New York postmaster in a little upstate New York uh, post office. Where do you see a book where the hero is a postmaster? And the heroine is an ex-district attorney turned writer, which I wrote before I decided to go to law school. That's a whole other story and a district attorney who popped in literally because he insisted on being in the book. That's what happens. Fiction writing is socially acceptable schizophrenia. So here's a backstory in a positive way about the postal system, about the post office. Characters at that time when I wrote the book, the postmaster general, he's a real, he was a real person, still was a, the postmaster general. Uh, the gal from the Postal Inspector's Office, who I used for reference, was, is really for the Postal Inspector's Office. And the, the gentleman who um, ew, I was patenting the book after was actually a postmaster in upstate New York. So the problem with that, I would send him all of the cha chapters, 
And he was making sure that every single thing that I wrote was completely factual, except for one instant that I kind of twisted. For you have to in fiction, and he got upset. He says, "Oh, it would never be that way." And I said, "Too bad. <laughs> <laughs> it's my story. I'm being as close as I can to the truth, but it's it's still fiction." So having a backstory of a radio station, a backstory of a, a post office, and then my third novel, Undercover Reunion, was actually based on a true event. My girlfriend and I were big fans of the TV show The Man From U.N.C.L.E. And we were going a year before our 30th high school reunion. And I said, well, wouldn't it be funny if we found out that Uncle was real and all our teachers were members of the organization and what if, what if, what if, because all fiction starts with what if. So Undercover Reunion came out of that scenario and it was published to coincide with the 50th anniversary of The Man From U.N.C.L.E. Wow. So all you uncle fans out there, there is more uncle reference on the cover of my book than anywhere in the movie, by the way. So I just thought I'd let you know. I had nothing to do with that movie. <laughs> well, going back to red wine for breakfast, mm -hmm. now you actually reference in the book some, actually some very well-known LA radio personalities, yeah. Yeah. Uh, one of which um, I did meet and unfortunately uh, Lee Marshall is no longer with yeah. us. Sad to, to I knew say. Lee really well. And uh, you know, I, I had a chance to meet Lee, and he did a local program on the Boomer years ago. Mm -hmm. But more than that, he was actually the voice of Tony the Tiger. Yeah. And uh, he worked for Kellogg's and did that voice, uh, succeeding a Thurl Ravenscroft, who initially mm -hmm. had done the voice years ago. And more contemporary, um, Cynthia Fox is also mentioned in the book. Of course, I talked to these people before I got their permission to have them in the story because it's kind of a nice thing to do. So Cynthia Fox is in there. Cynthia Fox, Karen Sharp. Karen Sharp, from she's still on um, 103. The Coast. The Coast, and I don't know how old she is, but her voice has not changed, <laughs> which is part <laughs> of the book. But yeah, Karen Sharp is in there. Uh, Jennifer York who used to be with KTLA in the... Um, well, she's with KABC Radio. KBC Radio, And she's yeah. working in traffic. I got a quick story about Jennifer. Yeah. Jennifer and I know each other. We had worked together in a radio station years ago. Small world. Yes, and so uh, Jennifer and I would periodically, we used to go to a, a local restaurant called Bob's Big Boy mm -hmm. in Oxnard, and we'd go and hang out after work mm -hmm. and sit and visit. And, you know, it was interesting. Uh, just a little side note, uh, she was, had started working in traffic for a radio station back then called KFWB, mm -hmm. and our program director had taken her aside one day and said, you'll never amount to anything, you talk too fast. <laughs> and Jennifer, we, we went out to, to Bob's and we were doing our little uh, luncheon hot fudge cake thing, and she said, I gotta tell you, Bill, I'm working for KFWB on the weekends. I went, really? And I tuned in and sure enough, there she was. And she went from there, did Channel 5 in the mornings and flying in the helicopter. Yeah. And now she's on KABC yeah. in the mornings with Mac. So let me, let me ask you this. From a radio background, reading this novel, which is fiction, how real were you able to identify with the story, what, what was going on. There's there. a lot of truth in what you're writing about uh, some of the characters because I've known some, some sleaze balls in, in, <laughs> in, in my time, and I'm referencing George Dimmick, a.k.a. Johnny Yeah, King. yeah, good old George Dimmick. It's interesting, I don't know how many current on-air personalities changed their name, but in my story, most of them did and still do. Um, my name when I was on the air was actually Julie Russell when I had my show at WELV in Ellenville, New York. Um, <coughs> my show was Julie Russell, but when I did the news, it was Raven Wes. So we, you have to have that difference in personality, I think, between um, what you're doing as far as your on-air personality. So it wasn't really necessary, and I don't think it's as necessary now as it was several years ago. 
but if you're acting and you're doing something that's not in the norm, you're taking on a personality. And I think not only did Doris change her name, but Doris could not be the person that she was as Jenny Reed, meeting the challenges that she did, succeeding under horrific circumstances. And I think my favorite part <coughs> when I wrote the book was at the awards with Melanie. And, yes. And that, that's, and I, again, because I read and I reread, I laugh in my mind. <laughs> <laughs> it is just really funny. And it has some heart wrenching moments. And it was based on the fact that my very, very good friend, Mary Ellen Grable, back in 1984, um, had a fatal accident and for me personally to work through the emotions red wine from breakfast actually came out of my ability to take something and give it some meaning because it was so meaningless at the time so that's it. Yeah, red wine for breakfast is my therapy and I'm glad you're enjoying it well I did enjoy it. You, you referenced um, that fatal traffic accident and I'm thinking of the character Gail in the book, mm -hmm. because she met with her demise. Yeah, no, Mary Ellen actually did fall out of a, wow. her apartment, Yeah, which is why I had to come up with some reason why that happened, because in reality, they never did find out what happened. So that's why I created what I created, and I'm not going any further than that. If you want to know. <laughs> you got to read the book, right? You got to read the book, and <clears throat> it's, it's very interesting to revisit because I did write that book. It came out in like 1999. First Class Mail came out in 2001 and I had scheduled a book signing event and had a big party and everybody was there and we were waiting for the books to come on September 11th. <laughs> <laughs> so the books were stuck on the tarmac oh and my. it was, um, and people just ended up pre-selling and it worked out okay, but it was a <coughs> sort of happy, sad situation because here we had all these people at this party scheduled to, for the book signing and it was on 9-11. But um, those things happen. You can't, you can't, you can't figure out <coughs> when you write a book if it's going to sell, especially in, in, uh, in today. I remember, it was 2009, I believe, and I was watching Joe <clears throat> walk across the stage with his iPad, and I thought to myself, that is the end of the publishing world as we know it. And sure enough, the whole ebook craze. So now, on one hand, it's good that there are more books out there for readers to read. On the other hand, breaking away from the herd to get people, so uh, thank you so much for the show, buy my books, they're great, <coughs> Kindle, ebook, but the ability, great books, bestsellers are not necessarily written, they are marketed and hyped. <coughs> Fifty Shades of <coughs> happens to be one of them, <laughs> and there's others that the writing is really horrible, but it catches on for whatever reason, makes a billion dollars, gets into a movie. Believe it or not, Red Wine for Breakfast was option for a movie. And I turned it over to a person who said he was a script writer. Pretty much destroyed the whole thing. <laughs> and I oh said, my. the only thing that was the same between my book and his script was the title and the names of the characters, pretty much like the Man from Uncle movie. And I said, I couldn't do it. I took, I took the option back. There's no amount of money for me that I would sell out my integrity. It, it just isn't worth it. So when I see uh, <clears throat> there is a writer who I really respect in the sense his book went from a novel to a movie was uh, the guy who wrote The Martian. He did research. It was a well-written book. That's a success story, but it's very rare that that happens. Uh, you have to, nowadays, if you want to get an agent, they don't say, they don't say, let me see your book. They say, let me see your platform. Do you have a blog? Do you have a website? How many people are tweeting you and all that other stuff? And for a creative person, someone who creates 
you're working with the other side of your brain. And it's very difficult when you sweat over a computer or whatever you're typing on, every single word out there, it becomes part of your creation. And then going to switch it into the business mode. How do I get it on the shelves? How do I get this? And I've been doing this in the book business now about 15 years. And it's getting less and less. Book signings are a thing of the past. Book events, obviously, Borders is gone. I've done Borders, Barnes & Noble. I've been to the BEA <coughs> Book Expo at the Javits. I've been the one they had out here, uh, the book festival. But it's not the same thing as it used to be. There used to be tons of them. And someone would come up, and they'd, they'd pick up the book. And they flip through it, and they're, oh, who's your publisher? Then, what's the book about? I said, read the back. This is what the book is about. And it's called The Ten Second Rule. If you hold the book for 10 seconds, you have to buy it. When I'm doing a book signing or a book show or a book festival, I don't have to be nice. <laughs> I said, because my books are that good. And I'm very proud of the fact that I was able to entertain and create, and people, I went to a um, <laughs> Lions Club, and the gal there, she was giving a presentation, and I went up to her, asked her words, and I was like, oh, that's great. She's like, Raven West, I read First Class Mail. It was so good. I, and then she's talking about the characters, which, of course, are made up. And I was going, that is the nicest thing anyone <laughs> said to me. And, such <laughs> and those little things like that, when I was doing a um, conference, uh, presentation at Barnes and Noble was it was a panel and I was with the Writers Club and this woman came up to me and said well I wasn't here to hear the panel I was here because I read read one for breakfast and I couldn't wait for your second novel to come out that's amazing I'd like to have five million more like that but just just one or someone you know you don't know me from Adam at least you do now. So the, you know, the book is, in my, it's well written, it's easy to read, it's not a bunch of big words. It flows really well and it keeps your interest. And that's kind of good and bad because people say, oh, it was great, I picked up your book and I couldn't put it down, I read it all in like three hours. I'm going, <laughs> but it took me 18 months to write. <laughs> Please read slower, oh read slower. It's like cooking Thanksgiving dinner. It takes three days, and it sits down. Oh, it was really good. It's gone. Read it slower. That's OK. Well, it took me a couple of weeks to read through this. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank because, you. <laughs> you know, I, I was, sometimes I'd go back to understand a little bit more going into the next chapter. And I also want to come back and um, make a correction on something I had said earlier about Jennifer York. She's actually working for KNX News Radio. Oh, right, right, right. Not KABC, but KNX. Yeah. So Sorry, Jennifer. Make, <laughs> Sorry, Jennifer. You know, I love you. And, you know, she's, she's um, a great talent. But in this book here, let's get back to a couple of the characters. Number one, mm -hmm. Johnny King. Mm -hmm. George Dimmick, that's his real name. Yeah. And he's related to Denise. Mm -hmm. We will give the relationship away, but he's related. But he comes across really in the beginning as a sleazeball, mm -hmm. but he actually winds up actually being a highly romantic, uh, lovable character. Well, it's very interesting, because I read an article in Reason Magazine about the romance genre, that the formula is that the female and male characters start out by hating each other, ending up falling in love, and this whole thing. It's a formula. But in my novel, there has to be a reason. Now, there's a reason why Johnny King was being such a prick, excuse the expression, <laughs> to Jenny. And we know through when you read the story, it's explained why that is. And then his switch over to the romantic side, again, it's explained. It doesn't just suddenly there's a switch that goes, oh, all of a sudden you're this, this. But I go through the process with the character to where it's explained the situation with it. And another one of my favorite parts, that it was kind of funny when I was writing the book, I wrote myself into a corner. The voice and the choice, I had no idea how I was going to get her out of that. None. 
And I'm going back and forth, and I'm trying to figure out what, how she could do this. And that whole idea of how she did it, I'm not going to tell you how, just literally, that actually happened. I, in real life, what I said happened that gave her the idea to get her out of it. That actually happened that gave me the idea of how I was going to get her out of that situation. I thought that was really cool. Well, it was, it was <laughs> clever by how she got out of it. I know, I, I know what you're referencing. Yeah. And then the tables were turned on her uh -huh. at the very end. Am I right? Yep, yes. Okay. So yeah. we'll, we'll leave it at that. It was fun. It was a fun read. I, I enjoyed the adventure. Um, there was going to be a sequel called Bourbon for Brunch, and it was going to be a political uh, story because bourbon is a political drink and brunch is a political. But I, honest to God, cannot come up with anything in the fiction world is more preposterous that's going on right now in in in, the, in reality. So it's, it was it was a trilogy. It was supposed to be red wine for breakfast, bourbon for brunch, daiquiris for dinner. Good alliteration on all three. Yeah, but somehow first class mail came into being uh, at a writers' conference, and a gal came to me and said she was writing, uh, she was putting together a romance magazine, and asked me if I could do a 3,000 word romance story. And I said, oh, sure, <laughs> 3,000 words, piece of cake. So I already had the ending, and I had the short story, and I ended up submitting it to a contest, an online contest from amazing authors. And I got an email back from the editor. She says, well, this is a great first chapter for your next novel. I went, next novel? Who did? I wasn't planning on writing the next novel. So I said, OK. So I started writing. I get to where I think is the end of the book after the third chapter, the third part three. And I go, wait a second. I can't end this here, because then the beginning doesn't make any sense. My books have to be circular. You have a beginning, a middle, and end. The end has to make some difference. So my little 3,000-word short story stor nah, short story, turned into a 96,000-word <laughs> four-part novel with twists and turns. And a lot of the plots that I found in this story were also based on fact. There was a lot of, uh, I read an article, and I said, oh, this is great. And I incorporated that into the story so that it made sense. So the betrayal and the anger, everything, there was a reason. It just doesn't come out of, out of, uh, out of the air. Same thing with Undercover Reunion. I have a character in here who's a good friend of mine, still a good friend of mine. And I fought very hard not to do to him what ended up having to do in the story because I do not write violence. Um, the espionage of Undercover Reunion is international counterfeiting. I don't do drugs in the stories. I'm a libertarian, but that's beside the point. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the drug war, the violence, because it's a spy novel, my husband said, you got to have a kick-ass submarine chase. Okay, it's got a kick-ass submarine chase. Got to say, this is, that's a little trite. But I just was fighting tooth and nail not to be graphically violent, even in the genre that it's in. Succeeded, except for my friend. Sorry, Dan. But again, everything had a reason. It has, it has to flow. Stories have to make sense. The one thing that I hate more is when I buy a book and I get sucked into the hype, bestseller, made movie, Excuse me, gal, but Help is, was one book. I sat there and I read it waiting for something to happen. And waiting for something to happen. <laughs> it was the boringest, nothing. And I'm going, OK, well, if you'd taken this character, you could have done this. If you, it was fiction, even though, again, it was based on the factual. But it was fiction. She could have done something. She did nothing. I was furious. That's me. I do tend to rewrite endings <laughs> <laughs> because I said, you know, that's how I would have done it. I write for myself what I enjoy, and other people enjoy it too. Uh, but again, it is the marketing and the PR 
and, and the name. You, you can only social media as much as you can. Although I was very, very pleased. There's a, an organization, um, <coughs> Man From Uncle Club, for want a better word, in England, who were having their celebration for the story's 50th anniversary, and they ordered 20 books. So 20 of my, man for, uh, my uh, undercover reunion went to England. And in LA, they did a 50th anniversary weekend, and they ordered uh, 20 books to give away as uh, gift prizes. Oh, wow. So they're out there. People are reading them. I'm getting you know reviews, even negative reviews. There's no such thing as bad ink. That's right, as long as it's some kind of review, because you know yep. people are reading it. Yep, and thank you. This was. Uh, this was fun. I haven't done one of these in a long time. And of course, I do my little short uh, erotica collection, Tales of Erotica by Firebird, Journey to Dimension Nine. And I call it Fifty Shades of Gray and All the Colors in the Rainbow. And Dimension Nine is eight dimensions above reality where all fantasies are possible. Wow. Yeah, it's good. pretty cool. Ra Raven West has been <laughs> our guest. The book, Red Wine for Breakfast. Yes. So Cheers. Let's <laughs> Let's raise our glasses and We should have some wine here. <laughs> That's right. We should in a little bottle, but be that as it may. Thank you so much yeah. for your time. And they are available on Amazon, uh, both in hard copy and also in, in ebook Kindle. Uh, Journey to Dimension 9 is only available in ebook on smashwords.com or autograph copies. My email, raven at ravenwest.net. My website is ravenwest.net. Surprise, surprise. So call, read, keep reading, keep writing, keep reviewing. I will. And tell all your friends. <laughs> all right. Again, Thank you. The book is Red Wine for Breakfast, or as they would say at the very end, R, uh, let's see, RWFB. That was the name of the RWFB is their call letters is for the Is their call station. letters yes, for the final are. radio station mentioned in the book. Yes. Go out and get it. Thank you so much, Thank Raven. Thank you. All much right. appreciated. Thanks and a lot. I'm Bill before and thank you for joining us right here in the community. And we'll see you next time. In the community is a production of the Heritage Media Company.